morning. morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. It is the, the Lord's Day, a day distinguished from others, where we come together and celebrate Jesus together. We hope that you enjoy the Lord with us. If this is your first time visiting with us in your bulletin, there's a perforated section here on the side. We just invite you to fill that out and to stick that in the offering plate. Uh, we do have some brief announcements here before we begin worship. Uh, you'll notice that there's no family dinner coming up March the 25th. Um, and concerning our services for the month, we're going to talk about, we're going to have a deacon's meeting right after morning worship uh, to discuss that. So if you're curious, uh, we'll let everybody know what, uh, what's decided. But it is good to see you here today. And today we can exalt Christ together. You'll notice that Mills on Wheels is in need of volunteers uh, to help in particular with delivery. And uh, so if you can help at about 2.30, on Wednesday, we need folks who are willing to deliver food. And then you can tell the lame Sidwell back there. Here. <laughs> Here. Here. <laughs> and um, you'll notice as well that uh, Easter is just around the corner. It's coming up April the 12th. And uh, actually our Easter egg hunt is going to be on April 5th, which is Palm Sunday. And uh, I want to encourage folks to start bringing in eggs. Probably the, about the best thing you can bring in is those eggs that already have the candy in them. Uh, but we do have eggs, and we, if you just want to bring candy, we'll accept that as well. That just means that we'll put them together. <laughs> yeah. And I think we we need we need near 2,000, I guess, eggs, something like that, based on all the age groups and roughly 50 kids running around. You know, you assume the community comes out, and you know, we'll, we're going to aim for that. It's better to have more eggs than less. Um, just because you don't want children with two eggs in their basket. Because then they might steal from other kids. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> um, but in all, in, all, in all seriousness, I, what you said, what you would have right? <laughs> I, the church I grew up in, there were like five of us, five kids, every man for himself. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but I want to encourage you to, to aim for April. Um, we, are, we are doing it, an emphasis that entire month, high attendance. Um, Palm Sunday, you see the choir cantata, they work very hard. And then potluck lunch and Easter egg hunt coming up as well that same day, April the 5th. And then you see we are doing a Good Friday service, which will be the Seven Saints service. Uh, me and Brother Michael and then uh, Michael Dickerson from Baxter, Robert Lawrence. Uh, who's retired, Pastor Isseline. He's been here before. He's going to be sharing. You know, remember that, that uh, um, you know, he's been in ministry for 40, 50 years. Kind of an old school preacher. Y'all know who I'm talking about? Well, he, he that's Robert Lawrence. He's going to be here. And I'm looking forward to having him. And then the, the pastor at uh, First Presbyterian is going to be here. And I think that's going to be a great time in the Lord's. Any other announcements? Anything essential this morning that I need to mention before we start? All right, well, let's prepare our hearts for worship, and uh, let's come and join the Lord together, trusting Him as sovereign and control, um, while also, you know, exercising wisdom. Let's pray for our neighbor, and let's pray that the Lord would take care um, of not only our country, but the world, right? Let's, let's pray it. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship with my brothers and sisters. We pray that you bless our time together, Lord, that we would be focused on you, and that we would enjoy you together. Lord, we pray that you move in our hearts, that you would stir us, and uh, that we would that we would not be fearful, but that we would trust in you and, and be wise, that we would exercise wisdom concerning our own care and also the care of our neighbor, our loved ones, our friends, our relatives, and those who live next door, um, that we would be concerned for their health. So, Lord, give us wisdom, especially in the upcoming meeting. May it honor you and glorify you. I thank you so much for Jesus. I thank you that... Um, the last breath I take here, my next one will be in glory. Not because of the good I have done, but because of the good that Christ has done in my stead and given to me. So Lord, may we get up and sing praises here and we exalt you. In Christ's name, amen. All right, we're going to fellowship. No handshaking, no hugging, no kissing. All right, let's stand and wave or whatever you do. All right?
match my shirt. Oh, my shirt. Boy.
the reason why he reveals that is to identify who he is, to communicate something about himself to his hearers. And we need to know that reality here this morning. Because uh, it's tempting to think that, uh, that God's not in control, that someone else is when bad things happen. And, um, you know, actually in Cookville, uh, the biggest church, one of the biggest churches in Tennessee, um, or in the nation probably, uh, he preached uh, last week that basically God is not in control of all things, but that the devil is temporarily in control of things. And, um, you know, that, that is baloney. Um, God is sovereign. No one else is. Um, the name of God, Adonai, literally means sovereign ruler. I mean, this, these are things that we learn in BBS. That God is in control. And anything that gets to us has to go, go through his fingers. And that's where I find comfort. Um, and, I mean, you think about it. Who, who do we pray to? We pray to the one who's in control. And if God's not in control, we need to pray to whoever is. I don't understand this emphasis. When something bad happens, like when my dad dies of a massive heart attack, um, you know, I think, he, I think God took him too soon. But did he? No. I'd rather my mom not have Parkinson's. I'd rather, you know, the folks that I visit to remember me. But God is sovereign. We can go to Him and trust in Him. He is good. And He permits things for reasons we don't understand. But we don't serve Him because He gives us everything that we want. We serve Him because He is good and He is God. And He has proven this goodness to us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so I want to free you. And the answer, the freedom is not found in having all the answers. Freedom is not found in getting everything that you want. Freedom is found in God, the only one who can truly give freedom. It's not that, <laughs> it's not that we know everything when we get saved, or even that the Bible tells us everything. But we do know the one who knows everything. And he has promised to save his church for eternity. And I believe him. And I invite you to believe him as well. So concerning, there are four points, and I'm going to tell them now so that you can be searching for them while I preach. We need to submit to the ruler, sovereign ruler of all things by repenting and believing. We need to rest in the loving arms of the sovereign ruler of all things. We need to pray to the one who is the sovereign ruler of all things. And we need to consider how the sovereign ruler of all things can help us when we are discouraged or when we are depressed. You know, thankfully, this is not the first time um, in human history or Christian history that bad things have happened. We have much to learn from those who've come before. You know, I'm reminded of Martin Luther. Martin Luther, who was... Uh, one of the principal architects of the Reformation, part of the reason why you're sitting here today is because somebody rebelled against the error that was in the state church. And that first individual, one of the first, was Martin Luther. And uh, in 1527, so this is about 10 years after he wrote his 95 Theses and nailed them to the door, uh, in Wittenberg, Germany, there was a plague that had struck the city and many of Luther's fellow citizens ran for their lives. Luther's prince and elector John ordered Luther to leave immediately to save his own life, but Luther chose to stay to minister to the sick. So he was surrounded by this plague um, that had wiped out. I mean, I believe in the, I think it was in the 1300s, it had wiped out a fourth of Europe, if I'm not mistaken. And um, so this wasn't something to... Uh, to treat lightly. This is what Luther said. He wrote a pamphlet on whether one may flee from a deadly plague. He said, use medicine, take potions which can help you, fumigate your house, your yard, your street, shun persons, persons and places 
wherever your neighbor does not need your presence or has recovered, and act like a man who wants to help put out the burning city. What else is the epidemic but a fire which instead of consuming wood and straw devours life and body? You ought to think this way. Very well, by God's decree, the enemy has sent us poison and deadly offal. Therefore, I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate, help purify the air, administer medicine, and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated and thus perchance infect and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he surely will find me, and I have done what he has expected of me. And so I am not responsible for either my own death or the death of others. If my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but will go freely, as stated above. See, this is such a God-fearing faith because it is neither brash nor foolhardy and does not tempt God. And Luther's right. Here we are almost 500 years later, and I think that's a helpful reminder. That's not just our health that we need to be concerned with, but the health of our neighbor. And so with that in mind, with that prerequisite, first let's look at what does the Bible say concerning God's name Adonai, and what does this reveal to us about God? You look at Genesis 15, verses 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord, Adonai, God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and here in my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven. And number the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And so it's interesting, the first response from Abram to God is to refer to him as Adonai, which is sovereign ruler. And he believed that God could actually bring this about. That even though his wife was barren, even though she was older in age, and he had passed the age as well, um, they believed that God could bring this about. And he appealed to God's sovereignty by referring to him as Adonai in verse 2, believing that he could give him an heir. Not only that, but in Psalm chapter 2, 1 through 4, God's word says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord, Adonai, holds them in derision. So God laughs at the nations who think they can overthrow him, and he is the one who is in control always. I mean, what is the worst thing that has ever happened in human history? Jesus is dead. The only person who is not subject to death, God, because he freely gave his life. God the Son incarnate, sinless. The wages of sin is death, he never sinned. Worst thing that ever happened in human history, and you read when Peter gets up and preaches at Pentecost, he says, right, that according to the foreknowledge of God and divine plan of God, you crucify, he's preaching at Pentecost, he says, you crucify at the hands of lawless men, the Messiah. I mean, it, it, it's amazing. That is the worst act in human history. And if God is sovereign over that, then it would be lesser to be sovereign over all the other bad things that have happened. Because you, you know as well as I do that the wages of sin is death and we're all sinners. That life is a gift from God that we do not deserve. The first breath on this earth we do not deserve. We all need salvation from conception. We all need God to forgive us. And I'm thankful that He gives us life. You know, the Apostle Paul said in Romans 11, 33 through 36, 
Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For he is, who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might re be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So the Apostle Paul, remember Paul had been shipwrecked, starved, scourged. Right? So beaten like Christ was beaten before he was crucified. Paul endured that twice. And yet Paul writes that from God, through God, and to God are all things. And so God is directly responsible for good and indirectly responsible for evil. And by that, what I mean is, is he permits it for reasons that he understands that we do not. So thieves cannot just break in and steal and kill and destroy unless God permits them. That should encourage you. Because anything that gets to us must go through Him first. Must go through Him first. And I realize that folks, especially unbelievers, want to scoff at this reality. And they, they ask questions like, where was your God when this happened? Or, um, you know, and the answer is, is He was right there with us. That's where he was. What I want to ask him is, where was your God? Well, they have no God. That means there's no divine purpose. You, you realize that if God is not in control of these things, there's no divine purpose for it. The Bible teaches the opposite. There is a divine purpose. There is a reason. And there is an inheritance awaiting those who are faithful. We endure these things with trust in Him so that when we stand before Him one day, we will receive reward from Him. And I look forward to that day. I look forward to that day because there is a day coming when He will set the books right. I'm reminded of Pontius Pilate and Christ. Flip over your Bibles to John chapter 19. And listen to how Jesus talks to Pontius Pilate. And this explains, I think this is helpful in explaining why things happen. I mean, we could, there's so many places in the Bible we can turn, isn't there? You think of Job, um, you think of Israel at different points. I mean, there's so many examples of God's sovereignty in the Bible that it is such a basic doctrine. A basic doctrine that I don't see how anybody could deny it um, in Scripture. I mean, how could God fulfill all these prophecies if He's not in control? I mean, how could He even cause a virgin to be conceived God the Son incarnate? How could that even happen? I mean, if the devil's in control of things, friends then I, I don't see why he hasn't just destroyed all of us. Or why didn't he just destroy Mary? You know? I mean, but what do you read in the Bible? He tried to destroy him, didn't he? Through Herod. By killing the firstborn. But why didn't it work? Because the devil ain't in control. That's why. God is always ten steps ahead of him. Always. It just, again, it blows my mind that this is, this that in some pulpits, that nonsense is preached, that does not bring comfort, and does not have any divine purpose for these things that happen. Instead, we need to cling to God. We need to cling to Adonai. We need to cling to the Sovereign One. We need to pray without ceasing and trust in Him. You look at John chapter 19, verse 10 and 11. Pilate said to him, talking to Jesus, you will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus said to him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. So God is the one who gives people life and allows them to have power and authority they have on this earth. Consider Paul's words as well in Romans 13.1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. 
There is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. So God is sovereign over every single government that has ever been. Including the various leaders who are in our various communities. Now God does not commit their sins. But they would be in no position to carry out their sins apart from Him. Think of Judas. I mean you look in the Bible. You read the Gospels. And they're calling him a devil numerous times, aren't they? Now, they understood that later on and they added it, right? Right? It was more, they didn't realize it at the time. Jesus knew it, though. Jesus refers to, refers to Judas as a devil several times. The, the other disciples just didn't understand. They thought he might be talking about them. It's interesting. Jesus said, The Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of lawless men, but woe to that man who betrays him. And that's where divine sovereignty and human freedom somehow fit together. Judas made his choice. Judas was responsible for his actions and his desires. Yet, Judas would not have been that close enough to Christ unless God the Son had chosen him. He is responsible for what he did. And you and I are responsible for what we do and how we live. In Luke 22, 21 through 22, Jesus said, But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Talking about Judas. Jesus had to be betrayed, but Judas is responsible for betraying Jesus. Although God had determined Jesus would be betrayed, Judas still made his choice. There's mystery here, but at the very least we must affirm that God is sovereign, not Judas. God is sovereign, not Judas. God permits all that comes to be. Now there's mystery here, right? But if God foreknew you, foreknew every free decision you would ever make, and still decided to create you, He rendered your free decisions certain. I realize there's mystery there. You still choose. It's still you choosing. But think about it. Did you determine where you would be born? Did you determine the gifts that you have? Obviously, I'm not going to be an NBA basketball player. Broke my teenage heart. Couldn't make the high school team. But, you know, God has given me the gifts that, I've, that I have. And all this has been divinely orchestrated. While still, I'm making these free decisions. Just like you being here today. You freely chose to come. But yet, if God had not predetermined it, See, we often think God predetermining means that He takes away free choice. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches both. I mean, you've got to understand who we're talking about. We're talking about a God who knows all things. Not only all things, but all things that could be if He would allow it. He foreknows all things. He does not learn. He is God. And yet, we still get up and really make choices and are really held accountable. Why? Well, because... We are free. We are free. We are free to do what we most want to do. And God is free to do what He most wants to do. You realize the only other choice to this is to believe that we can somehow change the will of God. And when you read the Old Testament all the way to the New, you realize that man tries and the devil tries, but who always carries out what he says he's going to do. Is it not our God? Is it not our God who's in control of all things? I mean, you think about it. you imagine being the spectator in Israel and seeing all these prophecies that God has made? Imagine being enslaved for 400 years under Egypt. Right? And, and you know these prophecies. You know concerning Abraham, and here God's people are enslaved. And then you see the fulfillment come. 
God raises up a Moses. God leads them out. God sovereignly leads them. And, it, and that pillar of fire and that cloud. But then what do you see? The people rebel against them. And most of that generation dies in the wilderness except for two. But then those two, Joshua, and you learn that God the Son's name is what? Yeshua. Who's going to lead his people to the promised land eternally. I mean, who could orchestrate this? It's not the devil. God is sovereign. God is the one who's in control. And so I think about it. That's why we pray. That's why we preach. That's why we study His Word. That's why, I mean, think about it. If God is not sovereign, how can you trust this book? We believe God carried along the prophets, the apostles, and Christ Himself to write the inerrant and infallible Word of God. It, it does not err. It cannot err. Because it's divine. God is in control of all things. And the Apostle Paul wrote from prison in Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm thankful for that reality and that reminder. If Paul can write from prison, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, then you and I can write it from outside of prison. If he can write it from prison, I think we can write it from the hospital bed. At the funeral home. Or on a vacation. I'm thankful that God is sovereign. And he's got a hold of us, and he will protect us. Namely, that he will bring us safely into his kingdom eternally. So Adonai is God's name. But also, concerning Jesus Christ, Adonai is God the Son. For example, Colossians 1, 16 through 18, says, For by him, talking about Jesus... All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So all things were created by Christ, and he holds all things together. So you think about the, the atoms. I don't know much about science, but the king could probably help me. Um, but I don't know that scientists know why electrons don't spin, just totally spin out of rhythm or whatever. Or, you know, like, I know there's electrons in an atom, right? Now, what keeps that electron spinning? You, got, you know the answer? Binding energy. Binding energy. Where does that come from? God. <laughs> God holds all these things together. You want to know why your atoms don't explode? <laughs> it's not because of evolution. It is because of God. It is because of God. It's interesting when I when I hear folks who appeal to naturalism and, and evolution, you know, we, these college young people are probably hearing this in their classes. The problem, the main problem with evolution is that there's no love in evolution. There's no love. It can't account for the reality that in order for us to function as a society, we have to love one another. We have to love one another. It has to be more than just a survival instinct or a, uh, a mechanism to continue the species. I mean, I mean, I would love for these guys to really sit, to give their wives a card that says what they really believe. My neurons fire for you, sweetheart. I don't know why. And they may fire for somebody else. Because again, if it's just chance, if it's just natural selection, if it's just matter and motion, there's no design or purpose to it. 
And so you can't appeal to good, you can't appeal to love, you can't appeal to anything that is divine. And most of these fellas, they're living in the world that Christianity, the gospel, has built. Look at where the greatest medical advances have been in the world. And you'll realize that it's in the wake of Christianity that these things have been done. Think about worldwide. And think about how Christianity has helped the spread of love for nature. So God the, the Son is sovereign ruler over all things. Finally, now that we know that God is a sovereign ruler of all things, Lord Adonai, how should we respond? Well, we have to submit to the sovereign ruler of all things by repenting and believing. If God is the sovereign ruler of all things, and He says we must come to Him through Jesus Christ, in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Then we must believe Him. We must come to the Father through the Son. Second, we must see the importance of God's identity as Adonai, as the sovereign ruler of all things when we share the gospel. We are too quick to tell people how much God loves them without telling them who this God is that loves them. <clears throat> who this God is that loves them. Many times we can, we can even present God as this weakling. As if God is doing His best to just get these people to love Him. Poor pitiful God who needs people to love Him. And that's not how the Bible portrays God. The Bible presents God as the sovereign ruler of all things. If you don't trust in Him, what's going to happen? It's not going to end well for you. When we are out presenting the gospel, we need to make sure that we're telling people, look, God is God whether you believe in Him or not. We're pleading with you to believe what is objective reality, what is absolutely true. Repent and believe in Him. Come and be saved. He loves you. Yes, He loves you. But if you do not love Him, it will not end well for you. We call everyone to repent and believe today. The second thing is we need to rest in the loving arms. All those who are believers, I want to encourage you to rest in the loving arms of Adam. Look at Romans 8. And let's read. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Romans 8. And I think it, it helps us, helps to put our, our mind at ease whenever we're faced with Awful things that happen, difficult things, difficult problems, things that, um, that I can't explain. Church, if I can summarize it, I, I, everything that we have in this life is a gift from God. Every good thing that you have is a gift that is undeserved. I don't deserve life. I've been a rebel against my Creator. From conception, I've been a rebel. I have sinned against them in ways that I have forgotten. I've done awful things. I've thought awful things. But yet God in His sovereign love gave His Son for me. Everything I had is undeserved. When you look at Romans 8, 31 through 39, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son but gave Him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or lack of toilet paper? <laughs> It's not in, it's in the Greek there. Or danger, or sore. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation. I think that includes the devil. We'll be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So 
So nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because God, the sovereign ruler of all things, has promised this. And he cannot lie. He cannot tell untruths. He is the one who is in control. And I'm thankful for that reality. And friend, you realize that all that I'm saying, all that I'm saying is, if it's in the Bible, it's true whether we believe it or not. We, we have a tendency to think, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my life to Jesus. And the reality is, when everybody stands before Jesus one day, we're going to realize that Jesus owns every life anyway. I mean, think about Think about how the Bible describes judgment day. And who's going to stand before Jesus? Every single person who's ever lived. It's not just going to be the church. It's going to be the world. Everyone. Why? Because Christ is Lord of creation. He owns it all already. Now who does He save? Those who repent and believe. Those who acknowledge what is true. Those who submit to what is true. We do plead with people to give their life to Christ, but it's not because He doesn't already have it. It's because in order to enjoy Him for all eternity, they have to submit to Him. We have to submit to Him. None of us own our lives, friends. There's no human being that does. Everything is derived from God. God is the life giver. Nothing can separate us from the saving love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If the one who is in control of all things says that you're savingly loved and nothing can separate you from his love, then who can be against you? So when we offer the gospel, we're offering a saving relationship with the sovereign ruler of all things. Number three, we need to pray to the one who's the sovereign ruler of all things. We should seek to pray without ceasing because we are praying to Adonai. Someone who is Lord, ruler of everything, and He has poured out His grace upon us, and He wants what's best for us. Remember uh, William Barclay on prayer. He said, when we pray, we need to remember the love of God that wants the best for us, the wisdom of God that knows what is best for us, and the power of God that can accomplish it. Now, I was reminded of Hudson Taylor. He was a missionary to China for 51 years. In his journal, he wrote, Our Heavenly Father is a very experienced one. He knows very well that his children wake up with a good appetite every morning. He sustained three million Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years as stiff-necked people. We do not expect that he will send three million missionaries to China, but if he did, he would have ample means to sustain them all. Depend on it. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. And so if God calls us to do something, He can provide. And He will provide until His will is done through us. And finally, consider how the sovereign ruler of all things can help us when we are discouraged or depressed or fearful. You ever felt down? You ever felt like you didn't want to go get out of bed? You didn't have any motion, uh, motivation to do what God would have you to do? Or maybe something awful has happened. Um, whenever I was in Kentucky... There was a pastor that walked into a pawn shop, and he killed um, a husband and wife there. It was, it was to rob them. It was a gold issue. pastor went in and took their lives. And it's very difficult to recover from something so awful like that. But if Adonai is in control... It means that you can cling to Him in the midst of those awful circumstances. Part of the answer to discouragement and depression is trusting in Adonai when He gives and when He takes away. One day He will set all things right. And His opinion is the only one that really matters. And so I find that even in the midst of deep sorrow and pain and suffering, that God is faithful and good and kind and loving. Like a loving Father... You know, when my earthly father was taken from me, my heavenly father was not. And everything I lacked from that moment forward was provided by him. And I'm thankful for that. Many of y'all have lived that when your parents were taken from you. 
that you found God to be faithful. You found God to be kind and loving. And I, I want to encourage you to rest in Him and to enjoy Him. In conclusion, in John's vision in Revelation, Revelation 6, 9 through 11, one day the sovereign ruler of all things is going to set all things right. One day he's going to balance the books. This is how John the Apostle described it, Revelation 6, 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. You know, I realize that we want God to balance the books now. But think about when you were an unbeliever, when you were a non-Christian. What if God had balanced the books on you? We often want grace for ourselves and justice for others. We need to seek out and offer grace because justice is coming. Justice is coming. <laughs> justice is coming. And so, friend, we need to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. We need to love our neighbor. I want to invite you. There's going to be opportunities, possibly, in the near future for us to love on our neighbors. We need to be wise. We need to be wise. If you do get sick, you need to do your best to... Um, quarantine yourself. You know, I heard of a fellow who refused to quarantine himself. I don't think that's wise. Quarantine yourself so that you can love your neighbor and, um, you know, care for yourself. Watch out for yourself, but also seek to love your neighbor. And uh, there might be opportunities for us to serve our neighbor. Some of you who hoarded toilet paper, you may need to give it to some of <laughs> You know, there may be, I mean, like some of you who have, like, I know some of y'all. Y'all got like enough food for six months, some of you. You may need to share that with your neighbor, okay? Uh, yes, care for your family, but also this is an opportunity for the gospel to spread. It's an opportunity for us to, to help people hope beyond this life, hope beyond this world. If anything good can come out of this, it's like that we are mortal. We are mortal. And so we'll use this opportunity. Let us spread the gospel of grace and love on people. I'm going to ask Brother Kenny to come. I want to invite you to come and to pray. Today is a national day of prayer. The, the SBC, both our president, has um, set this day forward as a day of prayer. So I want to invite you to come and pray or to pray where you're at. But let's all stand and respond how God may be leading. You know, prayer is one of those things that we can do. And we have the ear of our Heavenly Father in a way that the world doesn't. So let us pray.
lives near Nashville was to ask us about toilet paper. Um, <laughs> people are hoarding left and right. Um, I, it's hard for me not to laugh because who would have thought, you know, of all the supplies, that that would be the thing that people desperately need. What a first world problem. <laughs> Um, tonight, services at 6, the youth are at 5 with service at 6. Now, we, we are going to have a meeting. Y'all be sure to check uh, social media and check your, the app on the phone before you attend tonight. Um, but we're we're going to have a meeting and make some decisions. Um, the, but as of right now, everything is on for tonight. Um, I'm going to turn over. There you are. Come on up here, buddy. Um, try not to uh, try not to shake hands or hug necks or kiss or anything. I love y'all. Y'all call me if you need me, and I will gladly come and go wherever I need to go. All right. Uh, I got a message on my phone earlier uh, this weekend. Uh, a senior, uh, one of our senior adults, not I, but during the community, um, is raising her grandkids, and she couldn't get uh, baby wipes. They sold those out in the store. If you're aware of those kind of things, um, we might be able to help. We might not. I was able to find some and get some to her. Just keep your ear open uh, for those areas that we can help out um, in this time of ministry. Any other announcements? We do have a gold mine downstairs of toilet paper. Hundred dollars a roll. <laughs> Any other announcements? <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, we thank you today. Father, we thank you for bringing us safely together this morning. Father, we pray for those in our community that are hurting, um, that are fearful. Father, we pray that uh, in your perfect time, your perfect will, will come to know that you are the source of all hope. Um, Father, we pray that, especially during the time uh, where people are afraid, Father, that you'll put people in our path that we can share that hope with. Father, we pray that you'll keep us safe, bring us back together tonight, and we pray.